Hello and welcome. In this episode, we are going to talk about the wave of attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure and civilian targets that's happening in the two, last two days. We are going to talk about the ongoing Ukrainian offensives and further information about the Kerch Bridge and the mobilization. As revenge, Russia has attacked a lot of targets in Ukraine in the last two days. Over 20 cities were attacked on Monday, at least 11 civilians were killed, over 80 were wounded, according to the Ukrainians, 84 cruise missiles were used, and they claim to have shot down 43 of those. Out of 24 drones that were being used, they claim to have shot down 13. They, the Ukrainian side says some of the drones were started in Belarus, and Putin has uh, declared openly in, in television that from now on, the, uh, the Russian uh, Federation will respond to, as he called them, Ukrainian terrorists' attacks proportionally. This is in some way a good good news, as it is um, no direct threat for further no further direct threat about nuclear weapons. The targets were of those attacks were well weird, while some power plants have been hit, which can under some certain circumstances be military targets, but usually are not. Um, they also hit a um, playground, a park, the German consulate in Kiev, a um, bridge that is used for like a, a famous sightseeing point and an economic center. Even the, the how to interpret these attacks is kind of difficult. Either it was a sign of the catastrophically inaccurate precision weapons or it was uh, aimed to be terrorist attacks there is hardly little in between the, how this can be explained uh, except for maybe horribly targeting which would shine a bad light on the russian intel uh, sergey surovikin that's different news but he's now the commander of the invasion he was, before he was the guy to command the conquest of Lysyshansk, which is down here. And uh, Rigoshin, the founder of Wagner, is praising him uh, massively. The, the um, excitement from Prigoshin as well as, the, as from the pro-Russian telegram is kind of weird, as um, Surovikin is not really a mastermind. He has not done anything out of the ordinary. His conquest of Lysyshansk and um, Severodonetsk was kind of um, fine, but nothing, not a, not a strategic or tactical masterpiece. And um, when you see the whole territory, the everything he has conquered, it is um, surprisingly little. Um, the the um, excitement for him is that he's supposed to be a hardliner. He's uh, the master, um, the, the example of the Soviet hard man that is brutal and goes through the target no matter what the costs. And Prigozhin accordingly praises Surovikin for his participation in the military coup against Gorbachev in 1991 when uh, um, communist hardliners tried to save the Soviet Union by doing a coup against Mikhail Gorbachev. Prigozhin says... Uh, um, Surovikin participated in that coup to save his country, to save the Soviet Union, and he was right in doing so. From Belarus, we have further, uh, for, we hear the war drums further being uh, hit. Uh, Belarus is now, as the telegram, as the telegram of the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Belarus says, they are bringing their units, their military units, to combat readiness. So. Everything in this regard points, kind of points to a Belarusian participation in the invasion. I hear from UK, Ukrainian sources that they think it's quite realistic this time that Belarus will invade Ukraine within the next week or two. Personally, I still have my doubts as nothing has changed when it comes to the fundamental problems with Belarus, that it's expected their military to be far worse than the Russian that their military has far bigger morale problems, that they supposedly staged a mutiny when Lukashenko wanted them to be involved in the war from the beginning. And as of now, 
the question would be what is to be gained with Lukashenko. Uh, he can basically only lose and has nothing to gain anymore with a participation. So why would he do that? It makes sense to me that you that Lukashenko offers it as an aid to Putin to sound the drums of war, to make Ukraine afraid and force them to um, stage units along the whole border, which then can't be used to defend the uh, Ukrainian-Russian border or to participate in offensive operations. But that Belarus itself would invade Ukraine, I don't say it's impossible, but it seems unlikely to me um, regarding what is known about the Belarusian forces and their morale. But uh, I guess we will know more in a week or two or within the next few weeks, whether I might be wrong here, which I, which is very well possible. We have further news about the torture from Isium. I will put this on the website as well as where you can find you can find the link to it in the description where all the the um, links I'm showing you here are then a, a few hours after the video is published are visible for you to to find them yourself so you don't have to search them anymore. Um, the article from um, AP says in Isium alone they found 10 torture sites um, showing more war crimes being committed by the Russian side. Um, when it comes to their offensive operations, the Ukrainians keep attacking towards Svatove and Kremina. Um, still, they haven't reached either of them yet. Uh, Stel Markivka is reached and liberated. That much is, is certain. There are reports of them being more or less in, in this line here. Uh, lately, there has been rumors about in Kislivka, I think it should be here, this Kislivka here, that they um, encircled Russian troops there. But as with all the other reports about the encirclements, I tend to wait until I actually see proof of captured equipment or even captured soldiers. Um, if you follow the war for long enough, we've heard so many encirclements and thousands of soldiers about to be captured, which never materialized. So why should it be different this time? The so-called Donetsk People's Republic are saying they are still controlling the roads between the road between Kremina and Svatove, even though this map, for instance, would indicate that the Ukrainians have now reached it. What we do know, though, is that the Ukrainians, um, that the Ukrainian advances is forcing the Russians to prepare for the defense. We have this picture here, which is supposedly from Starobilsk, which is here that the Russians are already building fortifications there and there they are using civilians for entrenchment work. Um, we also have further examples here that uh, Russia is building heavy fortifications. This here is the trench digging machine I showed you in the past. Here we see it in action. So what you see here is, is that machine digging a trench for soldiers. And supposedly this is along the road here between Krimina and Svatove. But this is not what we can see here. Now is a video in Luhansk where the um, Russians are building a heavy fortification. Now I can shed some light to it, but I can't say everything here. This, for instance, I have not seen. But if we compare it with the size of this road here, this seems to be more or less the same width. So this is two meters. This is already enough to stop most tanks, um, let alone basically all wheeled, uh, smaller wheeled vehicles. So what we might actually see here is the Russians building a tank trap, uh, a trench deep enough for a tank to um, fall in and not being able to dig itself out and wide enough for it not to be able to cross it. And what we see up here seems to be infantry um, fortifications like trenches. As you can see, the zigzag, which is to be recommended for a defensive position to prevent shrapnels uh, hitting everyone along a long straight out um, stretch as it would be here. If an artillery shell were to hit here, the shrapnels could very well reach this and theoretically even this, whereas if it goes zigzag, the, the area that can be crossed is fairly small. We see the drone continue and we see some further interesting things here. These actually seems to be uh, dragon teeth. Dragon teeth, I'm not completely sure who invented them, but they were famous. We see it perfectly here. They were famous for the use in the Mannerheim line uh, between Finland and Russia, close to St. Petersburg or then Leningrad. Uh, it was also in, in massive use by the Wehrmacht on the Western Front 
on the um, Western Wall, as it's called in Germany, or Siegfried Line, as the uh, Americans were, were calling those. Those are basically concrete pyramids who, by their own weight, are supposed to stop tanks. Um, after a certain size of the tanks, they become fairly useless, and I don't see why it would be different here. They Neither do they seem to be so big that they can stop tanks by themselves, nor do they be anchored do they seem to be anchored in the ground somewhat but while um, a heavy tank and uh, not not in a in a classification heavy tank but a tank with a big weight and the 40 tons of the T64 and T72 might be enough to push through that what surely can't push through are the wheeled BTRs and very likely neither can the BMPs so in this regard it slows down any potential Ukrainian advance here um, it forces them to stop. It forces them to get uh, pioneering equipment to to open a way through it. And once, if that fortification is undefended, that just costs the Ukrainians a few minutes to break through that. But if it, this is defended, it forces the Ukrainians basically to stop here and um, uh, present to present themselves to Russian artillery fire and anti-tank guided missiles. So in this regard, it's ancient technology, probably a century old, but it does its job. And we see here the size of them within regards to the truck that is placing them. And that doesn't seem to be of that size that it should actually be able to stop a tank, even though I might be mistaken here. Usually we see tank uh, fortifications more like um, the hedgehogs, that are famous by usually using just some uh, railroad tracks being welded together uh, or just some other metal bars. Uh, why they don't do this here is maybe a shortage of steel, a shortage of tracks they can tear up and use for this. Those are options for, for the use that they actually switch to, um, to uh, dragon teeth. Here we see again what I would say is a, um, a tank trap, a trench against tanks, and we see here both of them being be built behind each other, where the Russians actually de de prepare for uh, prepare prepare massive fortifications for future Ukrainian offensives. Riva is uh, talking about a U a Russian counteroffensive. Um, I I haven't heard when I prepared that um, this situation report. I have not heard any confirmation of that because they claim to basically be in Torske and Terni. So according to Riba, they were more or less reaching this line here already, which would be like 20 kilometers away from Kremina, as you can see here. So that seems to be very unlikely, but I have not, and I have not seen any proof of it, but I cannot prove that um, it didn't happen. So as of now, I'll just present this to you as a potential event of what's currently going on because we see counter-offensives by the Russians in the last days, uh, counter-attacks in various places. Uh, it wouldn't be a surprise if they do it here as well. Whether they are able to break through is obviously a much bigger question. Further south we have the ongoing Russian attacks more or less south of the Siversk. They start usually around Spirne down to more or less uh, Marinka or Vuleta is the fighting going on. Here along the whole line down here towards um, Pif Pifki, usually the Russians are attacking and this time they do so as well. I, I'm, I, I save us the time by mentioning every town, but from Soledar over all those towns, along all those towns, the attacks are usually being reported. This time they actually gain some ground. I have reports that Optune and Ivanrat are now being reached by the Russian um, spearheads, so the, they are... Their forces are about to enter it or have entered those. And as we can see, that's directly south of Bakhmut. We had the past reports that the Russians might have entered the eastern outskirts. In that case, they would now be pushing into Bakhmut itself, um, still further advancing here. Very slow though, but they do advance. Further attacks around Avdivka, again, no advance here. Reports of attacks in, in Pivki, uh, Piski. Uh, 
attacks in Marinka again that they haven't attacked here in a while and the Russians themselves the, the Ukrainians more or less attack along this line and have not achieved anything either um, to what extent those attacks were where I could not confirm at all whether that was recon attacks or actually preparation for an offensive that the Russians are are talking about for weeks now um, is is beyond my ability to judge but the Russians report attacks here when we come to Kherson, we have um, further reports of Ukrainian attacks on the logistics, uh, lines of communication and command structures. Nothing new here. Uh, they claim to have blown up this and this many uh, ammo dumps and this and this many command centers and strong points. I usually don't report on it anymore because in the end it doesn't really matter whether they've blown up two or four ammo dumps and um, how, where exactly those dumps were. We know it's one of the concentrations where the HIMARS and Excalibur shells are being used to affect far beyond the front line to de demolish the uh, Russian lines of communication, command centers and logistics. Both sides are reporting fighting, um, more or less along the northern line here. It seems interesting that the Russians actually seem to have tried to uh, reach Davide Brit. Uh, we have reports about Russian attacks in this direction. They don't seem to have reached anything. Uh, when it comes to Duchani and Milova, the interesting part is that the Russians might have actually pushed back the Ukrainians a few kilometers here. Uh, the latest reports were that they were that the Russians had withdrawn towards Milova. Now they are being reported further north. So I cannot confirm that there were actually counterattacks from the Russian side uh, into that area, or that the Ukrainians have just have not been there yet. And now uh, the, the, it's just confirmed that the Russians are still there and have not withdrawn that far south as it was initially reported. But what we can say is that the Russians right now are further north than we had confirmation before. In this direction, there's also fighting going on. And here again, the Russians have actually gained ground. Uh, I can confirm that they've gained Pravdine and it seems they've captured... Um, uh, Ternovi Podi as well, which was recently confirmed to be in Ukrainian hands. So in this area, we see uh, Russian counterattacks again. All of this is an indication that the um, balance of power in this front line is not as one-sided as it might seem when the Ukrainians manage to collapse a whole uh, line, a whole side of the front and whole area of the front line. It seems to be more that they are able and willing to find weak spots and then exploit them. Um, that's uh, pushing in, but the, the result of that is they take higher risks, which bring higher rewards, but at the time, obviously, it brings the risk of a one time it failing with big losses. Uh, in general, we should not uh, discount the Russian forces in this area. We see counterattacks going on the whole time and occasionally actually achieving something which shows the strength of the Russian forces in this area is still considerable and not just considerable. Uh, the the uh, attacks they can achieve there are visible and we see actual results. In this regard, it might quite well be possible that they actually attack west of Krimina and gain some ground as well. Um, further... Further south, when we come to the Crimea, we have some more images about the um, Kerch Bridge attack that happened. That much is for sure. We have from Maxar satellite pictures. We see the bridge here and um, it's on from the same day. So you still see the burning of the railroad, uh, of the um, train here. You see that uh, those two pieces have collapsed and are, being, are destroyed. This one has uh, dropped down as well. But the interesting part is this is broken in half, whereas this seems to be more or less just slipped off the, the um, pillar here. Now, I've seen a theory because this one here has on this side a hole in the, where it touches the water. The theory is that it might have been an army tactical missile system, attack MS, that has hit here, penetrated through the, um, the tarmac, through the bridge and detonated below it because we see the signs of the explosion and a fire here. The train was right next to it, so it was hit and set ablaze. And this might just have fallen down from the vibration from the, the push towards the pillars through the force of the explosion. In general, I can I am not able to say as of yet what was the, the culprit. 
um, we can probably exclude a few uh, cases unless the image was faked the video was faked i in my book i can clearly see the truck still being undamaged the in the moment of the explosion which would indicate the explosion doesn't wasn't originating from it because you would expect it to be the center of the fireball if it was carrying the um, explosive so the truck driver there who, as far as I know, paid with his life, as well as the civilian car next to it, was very likely not the, the truck carrying, not the, the carrier of the bomb. So a truck attack seems to be almost certain that it didn't happen. In case it was Frogman, that's a theoretical possibility, even though the distance is enormous. In my book, it is clear that if it was, a, if it was Ukrainian Frogman, they would have blown up the railroad bridge, as the railroad is the much more juicier target, according to the fact that the Russians are focusing on the railroad when it comes to lo their logistics. So I would say it was not Ukrainian Frogman. In theory, it could have been a Ukrainian suicide boat, a remotely controlled one that um, that hit it. Uh, the issue is, though, that there again, the railroad bridge is the main target. So unless you imagine it, it missed its target and the um, the detonator exploded after it hit the the bridge here, uh, that could be an option. But then we would expect the the surveillance cameras to show us a boat passing through unless the russians deliberately left that video out which seems fairly unlikely if they didn't then the boat has to come from the sea of azov which means that either a ukrainian boat has passed through and then turned around or it was actually launched from within uh, russia's controlled territory which then would lead to the to the theory that it might have been some opposition that blew it up um the next thing is, as the detonation is on this side, it, one likely culprit would be a sea skimming missile. The Ukrainian Neptune actually has the theoretical um, range to reach the bridge from more or less Ukrainian territory, uh, controlled territory. Uh, as the detonation was low, not high, I would say it my in my mind a ballistic missile was less likely but obviously it could have penetrated or detonated even after a near miss so that cannot be excluded either and the last option is that is also floated around that it was a russian false flag attack even though i have to admit that my issue there is that i don't really see the clear benefit of that um unless it was some nationalists who wanted the the Russian government to finally take off the, the gloves, basically. As uh, as Medvedev had said, an attack on the Kerch Brit would be a red line. So unless a nationalist was remembering that and expecting the government to take off the gloves once the Kerch Bridge was attacked, uh, there are theories that it might have been the FSB trying to get rid of the military leadership or something like this. But we are there fully within conspiracy theory the, um, area territory, and I don't see any proof of that. So it, in, in theoretical possibility, when it could be a very much misguided Ukrainian explosive boat, it could be uh, sabotage from Russians. Uh, that are opposition groups. It could be a false flag attack. It could be a sea skimming missile, and it could be a ballistic missile. It seems unlikely that it was the truck and that it was Frogman. I probably have missed an idea or two. Um, the only thing I can say, the theory is that it might be proof of the army tactical missile system now being in Ukraine. That's the 300 kilometer range missile for the HIMARS and M270. Uh, rocket launchers that could be one uh, it's possible in that degree that the uh, u.s might deliver it without telling the public and they might only deliver it in very small dosage uh, in small numbers to do um, single approved strikes uh, that's a possibility at least i have not heard about the the uh, harm being delivered uh, the the anti-radiation missiles being delivered to ukraine until they were used uh, that the Americans deliver some without telling the public thus seems to be more or less proven. And that, in that regard, it might be a possibility. But um, as of now, I don't feel uh, capable and I don't feel qualified to judge what might be the cause of that. When we come to the mobilization, uh, first of all, let's let's. Uh, I have another video showing the damage from the heat. As you can see, the heat was so big that basically the, the um, railroad uh, tracks got weak. We see the axles of the railroad cars being bent. 
um, this showing the tremendous heat of those tanks that were burning. Now, I read a little bit about it. So there is still water inside of concrete, even after it's solidified. And if it's hot enough, it, it vaporizes and thus damages, damages the concrete. Whether that fire, that fire surely was hot enough, as we can see from the steel, but whether it was burning long enough to do significant damage to the bridge, I am not able, nowhere close able to be um, qualified to judge on that. So we will probably not be able to know that from the distance. Um, we might see whether the bridge will keep standing or not, um, because any, any engineer worth his salt would obviously look at the place uh, in person and not just at a few videos to judge whether or not that bridge can still be used or not. So um, those are just uh, show signs of how hot the, the, the fire was and how long it burned that it made the steel so weak that uh, the railroad wagons actually pushed. You see it here. They basically pushed the, the railroad tracks flat. That might be an indication for, for massive structural damage to the bridge, but it's, at least in my book, it's far too soon to tell. And that's, again, far from my qualification to, to uh, be able to judge that. When it comes to the mobilization, Russia, there, there are more and more reports about Russian, about uh, decades of Russian corruption and theft that has, incapable, has made the Russian armed forces incapable of supplying the mobilized uh, soldiers, even with the most urgently needed. We have a report here from the BBC in Russia, which uh, is talking, I will put the link again on the website, that within eight years, they found court documents of 585 sentences for theft of clothing within the Russian armed forces for 12,000 um, uh, sentences of um, uh, fraud and for 700 sentences for um, uh, keeping stuff and not returning it and um, basically what is it called um got about it i'm sorry um uh, embezzlement i'm sorry better better google it then because that seemed to be kind of important in this regard to to have it um the exact word in this. The Russians, uh, also the report says the Russians opened a recruitment office in Severodonetsk and the Ukrainian uh, resistance center, which is a, a government uh, station, a government office, is saying that they are recruiting Ukrainian citizens and pushing them directly in Russian uh, formations to resupply them with personnel while and while they prefer ukrainian civilians that have some military experience they are also recruiting regular civilians and just pushing them into those units that are being sent to the front line as as well when it comes to the political part we have the uh, reports from russian government offices that they plan to uh, move thousands of children from kherson to russia um, they call it a vacation um, Ukrainian side will call it deportation. Uh, 5,000 of those should be brought to Crimea, 5,000 more to Krasnodar, and as, uh, far un as I understand it, 5,000 more to Stavropol. They are allowed to bring their parents, but uh, the Ukrainian side is not expected, expecting that they will be allowed to return home, which would be equal to deportation in this regard that basically the Russians are starting to deport people from Kherson that they can likely assimilate, where they have a high chance of assimilating them. Hundreds of, um, in, of um, small towns up to big cities like Mariupol and Berdyansk here are, are out of, uh, don't have a connection to the natural gas system. The pipelines are burst and now with the heating season starting up, they don't have any means to heat themselves. I wanted to actually look up, look it up in the Geneva Convention in the I think it's uh, Protocol Four that uh, w which paragraph exactly is saying that it's the responsibility of the occupying force. But when you when you open it yourself, and I in, I invite you to do so, check the the Geneva Convention, um, the the um, 
protocol that is about occupation and civilians and read through it you find this so many violations that it feels kind of pointless to just uh, find the two or three articles that might be relevant in this case as russia is violating the geneva convention left right and center it seems kind of pointless to waste any time further from my side to to prove that a specific article in this case is violated once more um, on this channel we talked about it in the past for instance the russians calling the the uh, volunteers mercenaries and trying to to execute them trying to prosecute them like common criminals despite the geneva convention clearly proving that they are regular combat combatants um, other things like the deportations like forcing ukrainian citizens to fight against their own government all of those uh, there are numerous examples of gross violations of international law and the the laws of um, of war by the russian side that um, it felt kind of uh, moot to waste any further effort in proving this in specific points um, when we come to support of the specific nations the ukrainian general staff is saying belarus is sending 13 train loads of ammunition and other equipment towards russia which in my book again would be an indication that all of this here is just a show of force like fleet in being to force the ukrainians to continuously station troops along the common border as i at least would expect if belarus belarusia is actually intending to join the war they would not give ammunition to russia they would rather keep it for themselves to make sure their own armed forces are supplied once they enter combat um canada is sending 40 combat engineers to poland to crane ukrainian to train Ukrainian soldiers, which is obviously highly important, and not just the soldiers themselves need to be trained in fighting uh, Russian forces, but combat engineers being able to build uh, bridges, being able to demine, to destroy fortifications, like we've seen to to build them. All of this should be more or less the duty of a combat engineer, if my understanding of the translation isn't completely mistaken obviously a highly highly um, important skill in a war like this and canada is sending 40 pioneers there to train the ukrainians which should be a big help and and finally the last uh, message i have the last news i have is from germany the a german journal der spiegel is reporting that ukraine is finally being given an iris t air defense system which is given to them now it was promised to them for quite a while and if my understanding was correct the government was actually slowing it down again and not delivering it immediately but now after the attacks at the beginning of this week the government found no more excuses to slow down any any um, delivery so now they are being handed over whether this part of the news is actually fully true i can't really confirm yet i've read the the uh, comments accordingly but i was not able to confirm it myself to the extent to to say this is purely germany's fault the German government's fault. It might have been that the deliveries wasn't ready more early, even though it would fit into the rest of the the um, uh, behavior of the German government in this. And as I can't say often enough, if I do something like this, um, I can either choose to be accurate or to be fast. And with the situation reports in an ongoing war, I basically have no choice to be fast and thus uh, mistakes are unavoidable and um, regrettably will happen, have happened, and are going to happen. So in this case, I might be wrong here once more. Um, this, this was it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did so, um, you can help support the channel. This channel would not be possible without the support of viewers like you. If you want to support the channel with uh, a donation, you can do so by the means in the, uh, stated in the description. Other than that, you also help the channel a lot if you hit the like button. If you discuss um, with the other viewers whether or not you think um, the, this bombardment of civilian targets will have any military effect at all in the current Ukrainian counteroffensives. Um, every comment that is added to the whole thing is helping with the algorithm. And obviously, if you aren't a subscriber yet, I'd be happy to see you as a future subscriber. So please hit the subscribe button. Don't forget the bell icon so you don't miss future videos. And if you really want to help the channel, you can also recommend the channel to friends and acquaintances so it can you can help it grow further and get bigger over time. Thank you very much. That was it for now from my side. Um, thank you for your time and I'll be back.